So hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this edition of Soccer Hub Talks. My name is Ricardo Valveira. I'm the CEO and founder of Soccer Hub. Uh, as already many of, of you know, Soccer Hub is an online education platform for soccer coaches, soccer analysts, soccer scouts. Well, just visit us and we will find uh, the kind of content that we offer. Um, so um, before we start, I would like you please to introduce some information about yourselves on the chat box such as the country that you are based in and also some information about your city, for instance, and also um, some information about your job. If you are a soccer coach, a soccer analyst, well, please introduce that information on the chat box because it will help us out to adapt a bit our conversation to your specific needs. Um, also, as you know, this is online, online and live event. So you will be able to ask questions to our speaker. Okay, just introduce the question on the chat box that we will select some to be asked to the speaker, okay? So today, uh, the subject is conditioning coach past, present, and future. And for that, we invited Roger Spry, conditioning coach and consultant coach educator at UEFA. And the panel will be moderated as usual by Nuno Milheiro. So hello, Roger. Hello, Nuno. Roger, thank you very much for accepting the, our invitation. And now I'm going to leave you guys, OK? See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ricardo. Hello, Roger. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. And um, thank you. So as usual, and thank you for all you guys for being here again with us, like, like you are every week. And um, today, today, we have a, a great and amazing professional that uh, that I admire a lot. So I'm gonna do a bit an introduction that uh, that he deserves, and also because of course his CV says everything. And um, and I'm gonna do the introduction as you know usually, and then and then we start the questions. Also, like Ricardo said, please feel free to ask also your questions, and uh, tell tell us more information about yourselves. Um, so uh, for sure, so. Um, today, like I said, we have a great professional that is for sure among the greatest cyber um, in the area of his expertise, the condition and training. For me personally, it's a great honor uh, and pleasure. So I would like also to share that Roger is not only a great professional, but also, but also a great human being and an example for all of us. Um, we often talk more about players and coaches, like uh, like it's usual in football, but um, but there are other professionals involved in the game that are crucial uh, for a team's success. And Roger is a, an example of that. Roger started as a conditional coach as Arsenal, at Arsenal. And then please, uh, after afterwards, Roger, just confirm if all the information is correct because you have a, a wide experience. But I believe I did I did very well. Well, first I know your career, but uh, but of course I did, I did my research. Uh, you started at Arsenal. Uh, you never stopped to, to develop a great work, either in national teams like Scotland, Kuwait, New Zealand, and Austria, national teams. Uh, several clubs like Aston Villa, Sporting Lisbon, FC Porto, Ajax Athens, Panathinaikos, or Middlesbrough. Uh, Roger is also a UEFA consultant for 31 years. He wrote several articles for some of the most pre prestigious soccer magazines, websites, and recorded many videos and DVDs about conditioning training in soccer. Um, he's also regularly invited by a large and diverse number of national soccer federations for conventions uh, as a guest coach to speak about conditioning coaching. Uh, then I would like also to share just a quick story. Uh, the first time I, I, I met Roger in person, I was 12 years old. Roger was in Porto, FC Porto. He was assistant. He was a conditioning coach for the, the team with Sir Bobby Robson. <laughs> and uh, and I went for the, the team presentation. And I remember exactly that Roger was already a star. He was very popular. He was like um, a person that everybody admired. And, um, and I remember exactly that I saw him. And I was very impressed with him, Sir Bobby Robson obviously the players and at the time a very young a very young coach that was Jose Mourinho that nobody knew was also he was starting and uh, and he was there also with you um Roger you 
many people know this is common sense, especially for the generations like mine and previous generations. Roger was always ahead of his time. Uh, Roger was easily, this was 25 years ago, I'm talking about Roger was easily 30 years ahead of his time. That's why he's still here with, with many ideas, but he didn't stay like 30 years before. So he, he's always updated. So that's, that's the most fantastic thing. So time didn't stop for him. Um, many times, um, many people think that uh, when they are ahead, they can stop in time. Never happened with, with him. Uh, he always wanted to improve and, um, and he's always ahead of the majority. The, the great ones are always updated and, and the proof is that they are not afraid to share their knowledge and uh, they're all, always open to talk. Um, they don't have nothing to hide, um, not a, a treasure that stayed lost in, in time. Just to mention that Roger accepted straight away my invitation, what shows the kind of person he is. And, uh, and it's, I'm a privileged person that I can choose the guests that I can have in these webinars and I have total freedom to ask any question. And thank you for that, Ricardo, also. Uh, just before we start, I leave a challenge for all of the, the people involved in soccer to do a reflection about if it's easier to teach to someone that is very experienced and specialized in, in, a, in, a, certain, in a certain kind of um, expertise in soccer, in football, um, about the technology, or it's easier to, to um, just to train the ones that only know about technology to train them to have experience and to have also that knowledge. The combination of both is fundamental, but is only possible if you know the essence of the area that you are working and the, the essence of the sport itself. So to, wonder, to, to learn about technology can take one month, can take two months, but to, to, have, to, to gain the experience and the knowledge maybe can take 30 years or more. So um, Roger still has many years ahead of him to contribute directly for soccer and for sure you'll leave a legacy after his retirement in many years from now. So Roger, um, a big thank you for all your contribution that you already gave to soccer, but also for in advance for the contribution that for sure you'll still give for many years, uh, for still for, for many years. So thank you. Thank you for being here. This is my... I can tell you this is very special for me. Like I said, I always admire you. So thank you. Thank you again for, for being in here. Um, it's, a, it's a big, big pleasure. So, yeah. Pleasure. You're welcome, Nuno. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so guys, let's start, let's start with the questions. So, first of all, Roger, can you share with us, like, the? Um, let's start from the beginning. Can you share with us, like, uh, to tell us your story, how it started, um, tell us a bit a bit more about the concept and methods of the importance of the conditioning training at the time when you started well I was a footballer when I was young I, I played for Wolverhampton Wanderers and I had a very bad injury and I was off for a long time then when I came back I had an, uh, the same injury on the same leg and so that really finished me as a player but then I was m m much more interested in how to train players because I'd had so many different bits of information. You know, one, one coach would say do this, someone else would say do something else. And I was never really satisfied with any of the answers. So I thought, I've always believed that if you have the opportunity to learn from the very best, learn from the best. So I've done lots of work in America and I met lots of Brazilian people in America. And one of the guys introduced me to some people in Brazil and I was lucky enough to meet people like Mario Zagallo and Carlos Alberto Pereira and Telly Santana and all these guys who are absolute legends. And the one thing that really shocked me was when I watched the way that the Brazilians trained, it was very, very, very different from what I'd seen in, in, in England and, and in America and in Northern Europe. So the one, the, biggest difference was that they never train their footballers like athletes so none of their training was based on athletics whereas in in northern europe germany uh, scandinavia great britain and, and places like that it was always based on athletics 
And so it was all based on running. It was all based on strength in the gymnasium, all based on all these different things, which I never really agreed with because when I watched the way that the Brazilians trained, which was all based on dance-like movements, uh, you know, all different rhythms that they were working to. I'm a professional musician, so instantly I recognised how the music and the martial arts and, and everything was the way that the Brazilians trained. So I did lots of research and worked with lots of different people and then started to introduce lots of those type of methods when I came back to England. Uh, at first, everyone thought that I was crazy because they everyone said, well, football is not dancers. And I said to them, look, in this country, we're taught to beat someone. We look at the space behind the player and then go into that space. Whereas in, in Brazil or Portugal or Spain or countries like that, they don't do that. They look, they don't have any space, so they create the space themselves. Now, in Brazil, they create the space by throwing shapes at the opposition and then, they, and then the opposition reacts to the space and then they'll do the opposite. Now, all of that comes from um, a Brazilian martial art called capoeira. Yeah. Now, in capoeira... Everything is about it's based on um, being very, very unpredictable and very creative in your movements. It's not in straight lines and it's not based on speed. It's based more on like an animal, based on cunning and based on reading the reading the the opposition's body movements and then doing the opposite. And I was fascinated by it, so I started, you know, doing lots of research and working with lots of guys when I had the opportunity. And that's how I, I built up my way of training because I'd, I'd studied martial arts since I was 15 years old. So I, as soon as I saw the Brazilians working, I, I said to the one coach, what martial arts is this? And he started laughing. He said, this is football training. I said, I know it's football training. But all of these movements I can recognize. And he, started, he said, come back this afternoon and I'll show you. So yeah. he went back and all the players were indoors. And they'd all stripped off. They'd just got some shorts on. And they're all doing capoeira. And I just stood there. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was unbelievably powerful, unbelievably unpredictable, and beautiful to watch. And then that's where I, I became addicted to that type of training. So I went more and more and more and more and more. And then I found out that in Argentina and Uruguay and all these countries, and most of the Latin countries have a very, very similar background. You know, because of the obviously the Portuguese went to Brazil, and you know yeah. there's a Portuguese influence there. So you've got lots of the influences from Africa in Portugal and in Brazil, from Angola and Mozambique. Yeah. Now most there's there's two different styles of capoeira, but the the main one, the capoeira Angola, was was taken from Angola by the Portuguese across to Brazil. So the Portuguese, especially the the black Portuguese, I mean. I did lots of work with a very good friend of mine, Eusebio, and we used to talk about this for ages, and we did lots of videos together for, for UEFA. And he said, when I heard that you had come to sporting, I was a, a little bit uh, worried. He said, because I thought you'd be a typical English coach where you'd have people running around the pitch, you'd have them doing this. And he says, when I saw your work, he said, you train like a Brazilian trainer. Yeah. And and the thing was that it was producing results as well. Every player I worked with, they were becoming more flexible, more powerful. And and the one thing which all the physiotherapists told me, the, the injuries at all the clubs I've worked at has been reduced dramatically because the players are so much more flexible, so much more balanced the whole of the body. And, you know, so the big difference was that we train more like dancers as opposed to athletics. And that's where I've worked on all my career. And that's that, when I work for UEFA, that's where I lecture on, trying to explain to people football isn't athletics. Yeah. Football, not about con continuous running. It's not about, you know, how fast you can run the 40 meters and all this. But it's all about individual and then collective movements. It's like in capoeira, you know, they, they have the roda and they have two guys in the middle. They're doing all the movements. And then at any one given time, someone can go in, tap the guy and he comes out and he goes in. So it's 
it's an individual movement but it also produces a collective movement and you know when you see great teams play like barcelona or manchester city or real madrid or porto their movements are it's just like watching the big beautiful dance it's not based on you know all about the traditional way of hard work rolling the sleeves up and this it's based on fluidity and it's based on creativity and it's based on rhythm and music and that's why those players they're much more pleasing to to watch as opposed to a guy who just can run from a to b you know yeah and, and i always found that was very very limiting of course that's great thank you thank you for sharing that Roger. and um so like like i said this is a conversation it's not only an interview so do you think we have a great example i, I don't know if you agree uh, the great mohammed Ali was was known by his movement you know his body movement he was yeah. he was like dancing inside you know inside the ring uh, it's not that he was bigger than the others or the physical part it, it was the way he was he was moving his legs so um, do you do you think it's also a good example of Absolutely. the way you do it? Yeah. I was told many, many years ago, there was a, a very famous preparador physical yeah. in Brazil who worked with a national team. And he came across to Portugal for a while to work in Belenense, a guy called Gilberto Tim. Yeah. And me and him were very good friends. And he said to me one day, and I totally agreed, he said, you look at any great sportsman in any sport and they're all great dancers. Yeah. Michael Jordan, for example, himself. Jordan, you. Roger Federer. You watch yeah. all of these guys. And in, they call it the dance within the game. So all great players have, you watch Cristiano or you watch Charisma or you watch, you know, when I work with Figo and Deco and all these guys. It's not just, it's, it's, it's not just being athletically strong, yeah. it's been unpredictable and it's been, you know, like an animal ready to strike and, and then relaxed again, you know. And yes. I honestly believe that, that the dance within the game is absolutely crucial. Yeah, and you and you gave you gave you gave uh, very good examples. And uh, for example, Nani uh, that played for Manchester United, they have a background of of capoeira. Yeah, uh, you, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's very important. And uh, and also, you see, you you spoke about Cristiano Cristiano Ronaldo when when he was at Manchester United. Of course, also the age is important. You know, now he's thirty five. Uh, he trains in a different way. He even plays in a different position. Also, it depends also the position you play. But you could see, uh, you could see that uh, when he had more those, he was more unpredictable a few years ago than yeah. than what he is now. And and maybe uh, I had a question in here, but uh, for later. But but we can talk now. Is like uh, if you think that um, it changed. Cristiano was contributing a bit to change also the the way that. Uh, that people that, that the players also want to train that they want to train more the physical part than than uh, the creativity or or the movements or do, do you think it's because you know it's passed by this you know well, so honestly, everything. the one thing i've always worked on and this is why people find it very very difficult to categorize what my work is because i'm not i'm not a preparador physico yeah i'm not a fitness coach um all of those things but the other thing is i cannot separate technical work from physical work because the two things are interlinked so yeah. I, i don't just do physical work and then and then the players go to someone else and they do technical work everything that we do is football specific and jose and, and you know jose and, and we used to speak about it all the time Mourinho all the time about look everything that you do in training has to be football specific it's the most of the time having guys running around the pitch or in the gymnasium and doing this and the other it's not football specific we're, we're not saying that if you're training in the gym it doesn't make you strong or if you're trying on a track it doesn't make you a good runner it does but not for football and this yeah. is where a lot of players they get injured because they train as an athlete and then when they play they're a footballer and that it, they're two completely different things and a lot of people in the past And a lot, even to this day, they can't understand that football is a very, very, very complex game. You cannot, you cannot measure, you know, like every time that Usain Bolt runs 100 meters, it's the same number of strides. Every time someone does the high jump, they have that same number of strides before they jump. So everything is measurable. 
football is random random intervals of work random intervals of rest and random intensities so these coaches that think oh we've got to try and maximum intensity all the time you say well that's not football specific no not at all it's not about you know everything's 100 mile an hour it's not like that football is it's different tempos and the thing is what a lot of guys really can't understand is the word random because no two football uh, situations are ever the same no yeah the humidity of the, uh, of the of the temperatures changed the the pitch has changed and also the biggest change is the psychological profile of each player you know this guy might have not been sleeping very well because he's white yeah, they've had a new baby this guy is not very you know so everyone's got a, a psychological difference now if you can recreate that every time you train then you can measure it but you yeah. can't because football is very very if manchester united played against porto 100 times every time they played it would be different completely completely different yeah. and so if you use measuring devices from athletics how fast can we run 40, 40 meters and all, and all of these type of parameters, which aren't relevant, they really aren't relevant. Not at all. That 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 that, that was that was a subject for for many many hours because I also I agree completely with you that of course some numbers can confirm some things, but not on everything because you know football have have many things that. Uh, like you said, that that are different. You cannot you cannot measure them just like some other sports, even collective sports like like baseball, for example. The the um, the things that they do are, are the actions that they take are much less yeah. less decisions than in football, for example. What I believe it's like I don't know if you agree with me. It's phys when when we when we talk about physical condition. Uh, the first thing it comes to our head is to be a strong player. Not necessarily. A player can have stamina, but he can, for example, we had uh, Abel Xavier that played in Liverpool, Everton, and then uh, Middlesbrough. He yes, said, uh, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's a fantastic guy with a lot of knowledge. And he said for him, the base of be physically well prepared, it's, it allows the, the, the player, for him it's very important because it allows the player for during the 90 minutes or 120 minutes, whatever, to be more, his head is more clear to take the decision. So to show also his technique, but okay. it's not to build a proper athlete, like like you said, it's not to build like a robot. Like well, That was an English problem for many years <coughs> that we judge player by his physical size. Yeah. <coughs> I can remember when I first came back from sports in Lisbon, <coughs> excuse me, that's okay. And talking to people at Manchester City because a friend of ours was uh, the owner of Manchester City before they became, you know, what they are now. Yeah. Guy called Francis Lee, and I, I told him about Figo. Now I said, "There's a guy at, at Sporting Lisbon who's absolutely unbelievable." And you know what he said? He said he's got no chance. He says because a Portuguese footballer is too weak to play in the English Premier League. And then you say, obviously, that was a lot of years ago. Things have changed, but then. You see four or five of the, the Wolves players with Nuno. They're not yeah. big guys, Neves and all these guys. But Or you've got Bernardo Silva and David Silva and yeah. all these guys and Aguero. That's small. But the thing is, because they're small, they've got a very low centre of gravity and they can spin and turn very, very quickly. Now, for me, that's what a modern footballer is. Not a guy who's 1 metre 95, yeah. who's big and strong. That type of football is from the 1950s. And the modern footballer, he's got to be very, very creative. He's got to be very unpredictable. And he's also, because people assume that because Neves and those guys aren't big, they're not very strong until you try and tackle them. Because yeah. these guys have been taught not just to tackle with the, you know, the legs. They use the whole body. And they're very, very – and this is from martial arts as well, learning to use your whole body. It's not how big you are. It's yeah. how you can use your body. And then the other thing is as well that for, I work on this as well, that what's the, what's the use of having an incredibly powerful body when you're very slow thinking? Yeah. You've got to have the two things together. Your mind and your body have got to be in what we say. If, if your mind's there and your body's there, that means your reaction time to any situation is too slow. 
Now, you see people like Messi, um, Messi is like a, the ultimate example. He's He thinks and acts almost like that. It's like, and you, you see him up against four guys and he sees things so quickly. He sees the angles and the spaces and the create how he can create maximum, what we call maximum chaos yeah. by in, instead of the goal being there, he thinks, right, there's the goal. Where's the shortest distance? Doesn't matter if there's two defenders there or four defenders or five. He'll just go where he wants to go. And he knows if he goes towards one defender, the other defender thinks, well, if he beats him, then I've got a cover for him. Then the guy behind him thinks, well, if he beats him and him, then I've got a cover for the. So one guy can completely unlock the whole system of the opposition. Now, that is created by unbelievable technique, unbelievable football intelligence because he can see time and space incredibly, and also the bravery that this guy – you imagine how many times he gets kicked every game. Yeah. But he still – he just puts the ball down, gets up and carries on playing. And that is a, a strength that when I worked with Figo, that was what we worked on with him. We must make you stronger to withstand – to be able to tolerate pain. So if someone hits you, just laugh. If they hit you harder, laugh, laugh. And what happens, he built up such a tolerance to pain that the the defender couldn't beat him physically, he couldn't beat him technically, and he couldn't beat, beat him mentally. So Figo just wiped the floor with everybody. And that's why he became, instead of being potentially a fantastic player, he went on to be the best player in the world that's at one time. And that is because we got that combination of his mind and his body and his technical and his physical, but not just in being like, yeah. you know, like a guy who stands outside of a nightclub. We don't, that type of, that's really old fashioned thinking. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, that's very interesting. You, you talk and, and it came, it came to my memory, a player that I think it changed a bit the, um, the, the way that um, in Britain, the football, they were looking to football like big players. It was Gianfranco Zola. Gianfranco yeah. Zola was one of the first the first foreigner players. Yeah. And uh, he was like that, that type of player. He was a short player, but but he was such a clever player. And you had also a player that I, I particularly admired. It was Peter Beardsley. That was... Uh, that was a fantastic player. And and then from those moments, of course, you started to have players. And I can tell you one of the players that at the time I always I always liked him, but it, it wasn't one of my favorite players. But uh but uh I can tell you the players I watched many players live, but one player that in one of the players that impressed me more live was Sergio Aguero. I, I was watching him oh. Crystal Palace, Manchester City. And uh, it's it's amazing. He's so strong. He knows how to use his body so well. He doesn't have to run so much. And uh, he was doing just a movement be between the center backs, always going to one side, to the other, to the other. And then when they put the ball through, you know, he was already turning, acceleration massive. And well, that way is a modern player. Yeah. Yeah. That is, uh, you know, and Bernardo Silva is another great example. And all of those type of players, yeah. you know, they're not great big players. You know, like the old German teams of the 1960s and 70s, like, you know, those type of players in the modern football, they can't, the bigger you are and, and the more, the, the higher you are yeah. and, the more, and the more physical size you have, the higher your sense of gravity. So the more difficult it is for you. Now, if you're coming up against a guy who's every time the ball's going up in the air, that's fine. But modern football is not, if they play in between the lines. Now, these guys can't turn. And by yeah. that time, the turn to Guerrero has gone and he's passed to, you know, whoever. And you see you, you see players like at Liverpool, Mane and these guys. They're, yeah. not, they're not big mass. They're very, very, you know, um, creative. But also, I've always said when I used to fight, if I was fighting in karate, if, if I'm not there, it doesn't matter how hard the guy punches, he's punching nothing. So if I'm just standing there punching with him, but as I'm punching, I'm moving, he's, he's missing all the time. And that's what happens the number of times you see people, they try and tackle Su Suarez is another one. You try and tackle Suarez or Neymar or all these guys. And they're so clever about moving all the time that a lot of the time, this is why they get lots of penalties against them, lots of free kicks, because the defender cannot cope with their movement. And so the defender it goes into what I call a panic situation where he overstretches in the penalty area and gives yeah. a penalty away. 
Now that is created by a player who's almost like a um, like a, a, an animal. I mean, Mario Zagallo always used to call him Cobrinha, like a snake, yeah. like a snake. You know, sometimes it's slow, and all of a sudden, and it's gone again. And that's what these guys are like. And that's why it's very, very difficult to mark those type of guys because of the unpredictability. That's that's completely true. And uh, and one thing more that proves that you. <laughs> The, your theory it's the player that is i i believe there are like two or three top players that are very tall we are talking about attacker attacking players okay and you've been talking about them also the martial arts and we have zlatan ibrahimovic so is is a perfect example yep. if you are tall you need to have something extra yep. so you need to have technique also you know yep. so and, and it's really exactly of being unpredictable yeah yeah and as you say he's a seventh degree black belt a taekwondo yeah exactly so that's the perfect example that yeah. what you are saying you know if you of course not only short guys can make it but but if you are tall you need to have an extra thing you oh, know definitely yeah. that uh, that in the old times it wasn't so much like that you know like uh and it's this is brilliant and uh another question that i didn't have in here but it's so interesting what you are saying it's like uh, do you because i i believe that um what happened in brazil is like instead of being european teams to train like brazil and playing like brazil because brazil could win easily we could we used to say that brazil could could build five five different teams and can can win the first five places in the world cup yeah. but but now they are struggling because they are trying to train like like europeans like uh, do you think it's that's the problem because they lost their identity also on the train i think what the, happened yeah this happened before with brazil you know in the 1950s uh, that they started to train like europeans and people like pele for example who was just coming up as a 17 year old yeah. because they used to do capoeira pele and the coach said to him stop this nonsense we've got you've got to be more serious and you've got to train the way we train and now Pelly couldn't play that way Pelly wasn't a you know even though he was a powerful guy you know he he, he wasn't one of these and all this and then I think it was in the semi-final something happened and the coach said to Pelly okay today I'm going to release you so you play the way that you were taught to play yeah so if you want to do all your capoeira go and do your capoeira and that was you know he scored in in the finals against uh, Sweden unbelievable now you watch his movements in the previous games and he looks lost because it's all of you know it's all about running and strong now in the final in the semi-final he reverted back to his normal state which is more like an animal and he was doing the capoeira and you know some of the goals he scored in that tournament were just unbelievable but I think that the one thing about Brazil which is really unbelievably difficult to talk about people really don't understand the physical size of brazil so you know brazil has got a population of 250 something million people and so amongst all that 250 million remember you've got so many different coaches who want to be famous now they try everything and if it doesn't work then they'll try something again if that doesn't work yeah. what what happens and i guarantee it will happen is that if they're not successful they'll, they'll go back in english uh, sorry in japanese they call it circular learning so you learn that and everyone thinks as you progress you forget that and then you do this that's how we learn in the west modular learning so you learn that and then that and then that and then that but in martial arts from japan everyone thinks a white belt is a beginner and a black belt is an expert but it's not true a white belt is innocence but in martial arts you're not allowed to wash your belts you can wash your equipment but you yeah. can't wash the belt so their theory is over the years the more and more you're tying the belt and training this every day it gets dirty from your hands so it goes first yellow then a bit green then a bit darker then it goes brown then it goes black so that is the the path from white belt to black belt but that's, it doesn't stop there because it comes full circle. The more and more and more and more you work, you, you're doing, doing this with the belt, 
the belt starts to wear out, starts to lose its colour and starts to fray, and then it comes back to white again. So uh, in, in martial arts, everyone thinks a white belt's a beginner and a black belt's an expert. No, a white belt is a beginner and an expert. It's the same person. But what it is, it's called circular learning. So their, their, their learning isn't modular like that. It starts there and goes, and I say to the, all the people I teach, look at some of the things that you did 20 years ago and look at them now with your intelligence that you've got now that you didn't have 20 years ago. And they look and they go, oh, my God, I can do this and I can do this with this. Because everyone thinks progress is like that. Progress yeah. is like that. It's a circle. Now, a lot of, in because of you've said about technology and everything, people think, oh, you know, anything from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, it's it's obsolete. But that is a stupid way of looking at things. I keep going back and looking at the things I did at Satubel, and I think, oh, my God, I haven't done that for years. But I do it now with a, in, with a different set, you know, with, with more sophisticated equipment, with yeah. better timing and all that business. But the philosophies, they don't change. No. All that changes is your understanding of the philosophy. The philosophy is there. But a lot of people, they think, okay, I've done that now. I don't need to learn that. I, I, I've done this. I've done that. I'm an expert now. Yeah. Really? You're an expert now, are you? Okay. There's an old saying in Japan, only two people know everything. One is God and the other one's a liar. <laughs> and I've always thought that, you know, so you're always learning, always learning. And the, the thing is that sometimes you'll learn things that you've already th thought that you understood from 20 years ago. But yeah. you look at it now through new eyes because now you've, You've got all the technology. You've got all the the computers that you didn't have thirty years ago. So you, oh my God, look at that! Look at this, wow! And this is for me why it's very very exciting because it's not a question of training becomes like a revolution. Oh, you revolutionise this and you revolutionise that. There's no revolutions. It's just evolving all the time. And sometimes to evolve, it goes that way, not that way. Yeah. And this you know, I had someone say to me oh, about two years ago, I did a thing on a radio program, and this guy phoned in and he said, uh, oh, Roger Spry was fantastic, but that was 25 years ago. And Fernando Santos was there, and he said, 25 years ago, I was working at Estrella Amadora. He said, do you think I progressed as a coach? And the guy said, of course you have. He says, mister, you've just won the Euros with Portugal. You're fantastic. He says, well, do you think Roger still does the same things now yeah. than 25 years ago? He says, Cause I, I can assure you he doesn't. <laughs> he said, it's evolving all the time. And if it doesn't evolve, I mean, this is one of Mourinho's famous quotes. He says, everything in nature evolves. Yeah. What happens if something in nature doesn't evolve? Dies. Yeah. And that's where a lot of coaches, they are dead but they're still walking around because they think that they, oh, well, this is the way that we've always done it. And you think, well, so. Yeah, like I started, like I started with you, I always, you know, like uh, I always admired all, also that on you because you are always looking for for um, for oh. evolution. And um, and when we spoke the, the first time that you spoke, I, I saw that straight away. And like I said in the beginning, it was not a coincidence I said that, that uh, many, many people that you talk, they think they have a treasure, they, they prefer to keep a treasure, hide, they hide a treasure that was from 25 years ago, they think it works. No, maybe the core is there, but, but then there are many things around, you know, and you need to be, you need to be, even in the technology, you need to, to know what works, what it doesn't work, you need to try, you need to try new things, and that's, while you ask yourself, while you question yourself, you are always having the evolution path. It's know? for example, like at Satubal, there was no technology available for video analysis. Yeah. Now, for the last 20, no, 16 years, I've got every single training session that I've ever done with every club or every country I've ever done on video. Yeah. And I've got some special uh, software that I got from America where I can analyze. Um, a game and remove every player on the pitch apart from the player, the one player I'm looking at. So I can look at him and I can see his movements. 
exactly what movements he makes in the game. And so then I can look and I think, right, from this, that's the way he plays. Right, this is what we're going to do in training. We're going to make him work on his movements that are specific to him, but we're going to do it in an overload situation. So we either we make it more intense, we make him do more repetitions, we make him do it under resistance, but he's still doing all of the movements that he does in the game. Now, you couldn't do things like that 30 yeah. years ago because the technology wasn't available. Yeah, but, you know, so, I, you know, I, I used to analyse. I mean, Bobby Robson used to say to me, I'm Malcolm Allison, today, Roger, he says, uh, I don't want you to watch the game. I want you to watch Paolo Sousa and watch him for 90 minutes and tell me how many passes he has, how many mistakes he makes, what is the average length of the passes, distance he makes, and all of these things. So I wouldn't be watching the game. I'd be watching him. Now, that is relatively easy to do now with, with some of the computers. You just do this. and you just, So, you know, the one camera can watch one player. Now, you imagine doing that when there was none of that available. But we still had the, the imagination and the philosophies. Well, that's what we're going to do. All that's changed is now we can do it easier because we do it with better technology and more accurately. But the, the results are still the same. Yeah. You know? That's that's true. That's true. That that's that's to think ahead. Let's. We have a question in here for from João Francisco Lucas Silva uh, for a while, but, but the conversation is so interesting, and uh, we have a question in here. So um, João says, "I have a question, Roger. Nice to have you here. It's a pleasure. How do you think it's possible to balance between exercises of conditioning with ball and without the ball? And how do you think in youth football, even in high ages, it's necessary to isolate?" that kind of exercises. Thank you, Joel, by the way. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joel. It's a great question. Um, and I have a very simple answer, and it might be so simple that people think I'm trying to make excuses. F make the training football specific. Now, my question to Joel is, when you play a game, does every player have a ball? And the answer is no. Yeah. In 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 a game, how long does the average player have possession of the ball? Three, four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very good player, by the way, three or four minutes. So yeah. you so what you do, you do your training to involve all of the things that he's got to do in a game, whether it whichever position he plays, because that's an important part as well, what we call position related conditioning. So, in other words, a striker doesn't train the same way as a wing back or the same as a central defender. They train specific to their position. But so all of the movements they're doing and you know, in the training, you know, the conditioning, there must be a ball involved in the drill. Okay. Not for every player. So football is a, a game of with the ball, without the ball. So you must train for both. But what you don't do is say, okay, right, we'll do all that conditioning with the ball. That's not football specific because you've got a guy with a ball who's training for 30 minutes where in a game, like you said, he might have possession for three minutes. So you're thinking, well, it really isn't specific then, is it? You say, no, it isn't. So you have to devise drills which involve a ball somewhere and then someone has possession and then while the other people are moving or they're doing – because remember, there's only one thing that controls the game. That is the person who is in possession of the ball. He can play as fast, as slow, what direction. He can control everything. So make every player in the drill have possession for a certain amount of time and see what he does. But not we do either all without a ball or all with a ball because both of those are wrong. Yeah. You know, it it's it's football specific, so there must be a ball involved in the drill somewhere, but not for the whole group. So if you have right a guy with a ball and he's doing all these things around the pitch, you say, well, that's not football specific. Because what that does, it gives the guy a false sense of security. He thinks, oh, I can keep this ball under control as long as I want. Now, you know on the pitch that don't happen. Because as soon yeah. as I get possession, someone's going to close you down, then someone else is going to close you down. So you've got to do all of these things under match stress, under match tempo, under match conditions. So 
all of these things have got to be this is why training is a lot more complex than people think you really have to think about every single drill that you do one does this happen in the game if the answer is yes okay when does this happen in the game in what kind of situation does this happen in the game okay we can duplicate that does it happen with or without the ball okay so in other words if someone on the other side's got the ball all of your team are moving in relationship to him so these are the things that you've got to duplicate in training and make and it doesn't matter whether it's a six-year-old player or a, a, an international player the principles of the game are the same when we have possession we try and attack when they yeah. have possession, we defend. And it's that simple. Fernand Santos all used to say, and the rest is fantasia. And that's true. And so all of your training has to be designed for specific situations, but football-related situations. Don't just run for running's sake. Don't just have the ball for having the ball's sake. This is why... You see, guys, I go to do assessments for coaches for UEFA, and I go in and I see the, the players doing all these wonderful things with the ball. They, they, they spent 30 minutes juggling the ball and everything. And I, the coach says, wow, what do you think? And I went, are they footballers or are they circus acts? And he says, what do you mean? I said, that can never happen in a game. One, yeah. because there's no pressure on him or the ball. Two, it's completely unrealistic to train for that which looks good but there's no direct transfer to a game so that's a very simple answer to a complex question is it game specific yes okay so how can we create a situation to incorporate attacking defending you know uh, free kicks throw-ins whatever doing all those situations overloading adding resistance to it but it always must transfer, okay? Stop. Does this transfer into the game? Uh, not really. Well, why are you doing it then? Yeah. A lot of coaches do lots of things which literally just waste time. And that is the one thing that none of us have got enough of. We've only got a certain amount of hours to try. And so if you I went to a thing, and I won't mention where, it was at a big, big club in Germany last year. And I went in to assess all the coaches. And the, the physio and two of the, 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 they call them athletic trainers, they got those guys. For 30 minutes, they were doing plank exercises for core activation. 30 minutes. They'd only got one hour and 20 minutes to train. And 30 minutes of that was having those guys lying in the plank position. And this guy, I said to him, what are you doing? And he went, oh, we're doing working on core activation. I said, well, I don't agree with that for a start, but even if I do agree with it, don't you think you could have done that in the dressing room before you start your training, all the players? So now you've got uh, one hour and 20 minutes, 30 minutes of it have just been taken up by those guys doing that. So you, you, they're not using the time efficiently. And what they're doing, everyone thinks they're working hard because everyone's, you know, putting the effort in and everything. And you think, yeah. In English, we say they've got all the quest, all the answers, but to the wrong questions. What, what, what are you doing, wasting all that time when you you got other things that you can work on? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, like like everything, like and like your explanation also to to this question that it sounds it's to make the thing simple, not to complicate. So Literally. that's that's the trick in life, you know. Okay. The sign of a top coach who makes very, very complex philosophies very simple. Yeah, completely. Very simple. The opposite of that, I mean, the worst coaches I've ever worked with, the opposites are in America. The Americans analyze everything. And I remember doing a seminar with Mario Zagallo for FIFA in Washington, D.C., and there's over 2,000 coaches there from all over America. So this guy has stood up and he's talking, and Zagallo sitting next to me. And after about an hour, he, he'd done this, and he went, Mr., he said, um, do you understand any of this? I went, absolutely none. He said, he said now remember, this is the guy who's got four World Cup medals. Yeah, yeah. Probably one of the best, most successful people in football in history. Now, if he doesn't understand it, 
what ch what chance have these young coaches in the audience got? Now, when I got up, I'm the opposite. Everything's very simple. You say, right, this, 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 this. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the point. You know, a good coach makes complicated ideals simple, and a bad coach makes very simple drills very, very complex. It makes him think that he's clever. Yeah. I think I think that's that's the big. Of course, I followed Mourinho's career, and of course, I admire a lot. And I think it's it's, it's his biggest thing is like to make the things that looks hard to make them simple since the beginning. And um, he, he's he's like he can he can see what are the qualities of the players and take the best from them. You know, uh, each player is different. And uh, we have, for example, f for instance, we have a, a, a great example of a player now that is playing for Manchester United. Not only that player changed all the team, it was Bruno Fernandes. And no, nobody was was like giving him the credit like they give to Paul Pogba or to other players. And uh, and that and, kind and of... And he's not big and powerful and strong, is he? I mean, you know, I mean, Fernandes is he's, he's quite slim, but he's... Yeah. He thinks quicker than everyone else. Yeah, completely. Game intelligence is completely different from everyone else because he he sees things before they happen and yeah. gets into position. And he makes Pogba look a better player because he goes into positions of support yeah. and then gives it to him. And you know he's completely changed Manchester Manchester United's psychology because yeah. I've seen a guy come in who's hungry, technically fantastic, works hard. Because people think if you're a very good technical player, you don't work hard. Yeah. You say, well, have you watched Messi? What have you watch what Messi does when he loses the ball? Yeah. It's woof. They're like they're like wolves. Yeah. You know, and this is technique and, and you know is not enough, or being very very strong physically is not enough. You've got to be everything. You've got to think quick, be unpredictable. You've got to be a that as good as you can be individually, which then makes the collective even stronger. So, you know, you watch when Christian, I mean, the the one thing that always sticks out in my mind with Cristiano is when they won the Euro European Championship and when he got injured and you could see he was heartbroken. Yeah. But then I saw the Royal Cristiano. Him and Fernand on the side, that, you know, he's... And you look and you think your contribution for Portugal winning that was probably more off the pitch than it was on the pitch. Yeah. Unbelievable. Now, mm. that is a sign of a not just a great player, of a, an absolute monster of a player. Yeah. Phenomenal. And a phenomenal man to do things like that. Wonderful. Yeah, that's true. That's, I agree. I, I say that um, France, uh, we don't know, of course, it's not fair to say that they did on purpose, but the best thing they did, it was to injure Cristiano. Because, like you said, in the beginning, of course, we are all shocked watching the, the match, you know. With Cristiano, it's already hard. Without him, it's almost impossible. But even his, his teammates, the respect they had for him, they, they said, let's win this for him also. And, um, and there is a, uh, there is on YouTube, there is a video showing the... Um, a bit of the final, like those moments with Cristiano, and then the players also talk, and it's brilliant. And then actually, it was, uh, I think, it was the reason why we won that final. It was the, the, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Fernand, Fernand Santos, who's a very close friend of mine, he told me, he yeah. said, and I was talking to uh, Ricardo Cavallo because yeah. I work in the Porto, and me and Ricardo were always big friends, yeah. and you know, because we, I was there with Austria. You know, because we played against Portland, our qualifiers. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it was incre incredible to see these guys. You know, I mean, Ricardo was thirty eight, thirty eight, still unbelievably fit. And you know, you look at him, you think it's not an accident that these guys are good. They've worked hard, and they've dedicated their lives, and they've made you know, mutual sacrificio. You know, yeah, they yeah. sacrifice a lot. And people yeah. don't see that. All they see is the end product. And they say, oh, yeah, I'd love to be Cristiano. And I said, you've got no chance because you've got no idea of what he sacrificed to be yeah. that. Same as Deco and, you know, Palinio Santos and all of these guys at Porto and Capuche and all yeah, of that. You that's don't a, good yeah. by accident, you know. 
it's not yeah people want the the the, the product to finish you know the final product we yeah. i had the chance to to interview paul futre that that you know it's the legend you know and uh and paul futre was was when he was at sporting when he was he was very young he was traveling by boat to go to to the to the um, the other side of the river one hour every night you know like and he was going on the boat and he was telling me he was going on the boat doing some exercises to pra practicing like you if he was shalan or if he was other players you know and then the sacrifice he made it was massive sacrifice ronaldo the same he left madeira he left his family very young you know and, uh, and many of them they cannot make it so it's not it's not like it's like you said you are a professional musician if you want to be a professional musician, you need to, to go through a big path, you know, and maybe you cannot make it, you know, but you need to, to, to try hard to, to train every day, you know, because if you stop playing now for a year, next year, you are not playing so well, you know, it's, it's like every day, every day. And, and people don't understand that many times, you know, it's not only to look and oh, this guy is amazing. No, it's every choice that you make in life. You know, and it's the way you think and you question yourself if you can make it better, if you if you cannot make it better, maybe it's not the best way for you only because he, someone does that way doesn't mean that it works for you. It's 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 many, many things that are that are around. And um and this is completely brilliant the the conversation that we are having in my perspective. And uh, we have here more uh, another. We have several questions, but uh, we have here a question from uh, Bogra Aksu. Um, who is the most? This is uh, who is the most hardworking player when you were working in Austria national team as a conditional trainer? If you if you if you like to 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 answer. Yeah, I mean, all of them. That that's a simple answer. Yeah. All of them, because we introduced a way of training which at first they thought was crazy yeah. uh, because the austrians were like the germans from 20 years before where everything was based on discipline and organization and hard work then the first day i've arrived and i've got the music outside and i've got all the players doing it. and then when they started to see the the way that the players were improving um but there was one who stood out and he still stands stand out it was david alaba yeah, David, yeah. David was I worked with David when he was 16 uh, all the way through till last year and his attitude is unbelievable and it's you know very intelligent boy very humble uh, hard working but never satisfied he always wants to be better tomorrow and that's why that's the thing you know with when I worked with Figo and and Paolo Sousa and Balakoff and all these guys they were never satisfied yeah, because they knew that they, there was always parts of their game that they could improve because there's no such thing as a perfect footballer. And they knew that. And so Figo wanted to work on this and Balakoff wanted to work on that and Capouche wanted to work on something else and Felipe wanted to work on this. And so what we tried to do was, apart from the collective training that we did, I gave all the players an individual program, which was for their specific weaknesses. And then we we'd work on that at the end of training. So we'd stay another hour every day to do specific training with each individual. Um, and that's why those players are great players because they are never satisfied. Yeah. I honestly believe Jarno will play another three, four, maybe five years. Completely. Yeah, he can. If he, if he wishes, if it's his wish. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can. Top level. And um, and yeah, so to, we are almost finishing. The question I have, it's like, um, like we say, like uh, you always been like, you, like you also said now in Austria, and I believe all your career, every time you arrived in a club, people were thinking you were crazy in some way because everybody that thinks a bit out of the box have different ideas. Um, it's natural; people start to judge that way. But after that, it's they see exactly when you know exactly what you are doing. Uh, <laughs> that why you will leave you will leave a, a legacy behind because the way the way you think so um, how it's a satisfaction for you to to show the players actually your methods and them to learn to be open for that when you arrive to a place you already know they will be like thinking or they think 
for sure. You arrive to some clubs or national teams that the players think they already know everything. And then you can show them that actually, because some players, like like you mentioned before, like all of us in life are always learning. doesn't matter the age. So some players, they we had interviews with players that uh, they said they, they started to, to learn, for example, about ta- the tactical knowledge when they were 28, for example. Do you do it's it happened to you that players with 30 years old, 29, 31, they they were learning things with you and they were very grateful for that? Well, the best example that I can give was Jordao. Yeah. I mean, Jordao at sporting, he had a bad injury and they said he would never play again. So they he retired and sporting yeah. took the insurance from you know from his retirement. And then one day Manel Fernandes, who was his very close friend, he said, would you mind if one of my friends come and watch the training? And I said, no, of course not. So he came and it was Jordao. And Jordao was sitting there and you could see him watching the training and you could see he got tears in his eyes. And I said to him, Rui, would you like to play again? And he started crying. He said, mister, he says, I can't walk properly. He said, I would give anything to be able to play again. He said, but it's impossible. And I said, Rui, I will promise you, if you give me permission for me to train you, I will make you fit, not just fit to play, but fitter than you've ever been in your career. And he said, I'll do anything, Mr. And I says, listen, it's not going to be easy. There are Sometimes you're going to hate me and you're going to be crying and screaming and I'm just going to go like this. So he says, anything, Mr. 11 weeks later, he was the fittest player in Stubal. So they signed him. That season, he was the top scorer in the league. The following year, he was the top scorer again. And after a four-year absence, he played for the national team again. And he said, because me and him became very, very, very close friends. And he said to me, Roger, I was fitter when I was 36 than I was when I was 24. And he said, because you've made me do things that I didn't think were absolutely possible. And I did the same. He was the best example, but there was Eureka because everyone thought that Eureka was finished. So we had him and Al Fernandes, Eureka, uh, Adimir, all of these guys who were 34, 35, Zazinho, all of those guys, 35, 36, 37. And everyone, when we went first to Setubal, said, this team will be dead by Christmas because every one of them is too old. So they'll all be okay for the first 10 games, and then they'll all just do this. And then Satubal will have big problems. Yeah. Wrong. We were the fittest team in the league easily. We won promotion. And then the following season, the first game, the following season with those players, we played against Benfica away. And it wasn't at the Stadio de Luz because it was something that was having a concert there. So it was at the National Stadium. Yeah. And we, we beat them. Satubal beat Benfica. And, and the president is... He couldn't believe it. And everyone was saying, and the one thing that no one could believe, the Portuguese Federation couldn't believe that what we did was natural because they sent the drug test in. The people in Sturbel had more drug tests than all of the rest of the league put together because no one, people like Anani and all these guys, no one could believe that these guys were running around like 20-year-old guys. And, and of course, they were fitter than ever. But with all their years of experience, they were fantastic. Fantastic. The best game I've ever been involved in my whole life was Porto, who were the European champions and the World Club champions yeah. at, at the Bonfim. Arthur George was on the thing, on the on the bench, and we drew 4-4. Best game of football I've ever seen in my life. And we, most people, when they played against Porto, they would just defend and defend. We've gone on the pitch, we've attacked, we just attacked them. And Arthur George was saying, I've never seen anyone play against us like that. He said, These guys are unbelievable. But that was the case to say that with correct training and with correct everything, a player should be at his peak, in my opinion, 34, 35, 36, because he's had all those years of experience. So with that experience plus the fitness he's got. I did some work in AC Milan many years ago with Paolo Maldini and Rui Costa. And they were the same. There was Costa Curta, there was Cafu, Rui. All of these guys, 35, 36, 37, 38, they won the Champions League with the oldest average team. Yeah, that's, 
because they train properly. Yeah. You know. That's the best example, you know, you can give. And that's 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 amazing. That's unbelievable. And uh, unfortunately, we are almost finishing. For me, we could be here hours and hours and hours. Um, so as you've been always ahead, um, how do you see that uh, in a specific area that that we are talking about more the, um, the conditioning training how do we see the things in 20 years time so like you said like you said previously you said that um, the principles are, are all the same and even in life if we look to them you know for many 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 centuries ago the principles were the same you know we follow things that that were happening 200 300 years ago some things don't change only the the things around change the um, like you said about also the example about the the philosophy they use in japan they have that has centuries and it's still and it's still in, in this time is used so do you think in 20 years time the principles will be the same like you were using 30 years ago but with the slightly changes or do I, you think it's going to yeah. change completely i think what will happen you know um technology will enable players to train in a completely different way so you know you'll be able to do lots of things in training that you new new skills to learn um where you'll be able to do things in you know um how can you explain gravity free yeah chambers so players can practice doing overhead kicks or high kicks or spinning kicks without any fear of hurting themselves or falling over so i think what will happen because of that type of technology um the player will evolve into a completely different kind of uh it'd be more like capoeira even more so because you know the movements so you'll find instead of the the players will get much more receptive to unusual training methods and because of those unusual methods the players will become more unpredictable because At the moment, even small teams are very well organized tactically. So even a very small team can stop a big team playing. But they, you know, to get around that, a big team is still organized, but they've got players who can do unusual things. They, in English, we say it's someone who can break the system. And so they'll have like Messi and Cristiano and all these guys, and they'll produce more and more players who are capable of breaking systems. And that will come with an individual change in the player's physical abilities. So they'll be able to, you know, kick from here and do, you know, lots of unusual things. We say some, I mean, I don't know if you ever remember the goal that um, Ibrahimovic scored against England, the overhead kick from 40. Yeah. Now, yeah. There's no way you can do that unless you're martial arts trained. Yeah, completely. And what I'm saying, a lot of people will see that lots of the things can increase your flexibility, your power, all of these things away from football. So, you know, dance training, martial arts training, capoeira type of training, all of these different things will make the modern player more and more difficult to play against. So so, so it's like the circle we've been talking about. 30 years ago you were here, yes. and in 20 years' time you'll be here again. Absolutely. Just just with different technology of course that's the normal evolution the way but, we measure it the way yeah. the, the way we can implement it but the philosophy will be the same yeah yeah you know, so you know football has rules and within those rules you know i always when i used to, when i when i talked to mario zagallo we always talk about jazz because we want our players to be like jazz musicians we want them to be able to improvise all of the time Now, to be able to improvise, you've got to know all the rules. So you learn all the rules and you think, yeah, but I don't need this, I don't need that, I don't know, I could do this instead and I don't need this. So you'll get a player who is really, really uh, imaginative and creative in his, some of his movements like the, the Ibrahimovic thing. I think you'll see much, much more of that type of thing in the future. Definitely. And last, last question, Roger, um, to finish. This question was not pretty much everything we talked wasn't prepared. Uh, I, I like the conversation to flow. So, like you said, you are a professional musician. Do you think, like in music, for example, let's say a piano player, yeah, you can learn to play the piano, the technical part, you can play amazingly. Yeah. 
-hmm. but let's say that when you play let, let's say guitar you, you play guitar yeah that's correct so usually we say i can distinguish when is brian may is playing a guitar you know and another another person can know the technique but he's not enjoying he doesn't have the same feeling he doesn't have the same touch do you think a footballer should also have the same pleasure playing so the result in the end is the is is like unique because yeah. it's something yeah. mechanic you know it's like music like you said it's something cannot be mechanic because well, this is why you know yeah. there's a part, part of my work which i don't talk to a lot of people about because they get confused now this is I talked to Zagallo about this and to Mourinho about this. This is the spiritual side of football. Yeah. The emotional side of football. Now, that has got to be part of your everyday training. It's got to be spiritual. It's got to be emotional. Yeah. But we're not talking about religion. We're talking about a feeling. So it's – it's you get joy not just from winning games, which is yeah. the big joy, but you can go on the pitch and do everything to the best of your ability – and still come off the pitch happy but sad that you've lost. So yeah. uh, this winning and losing, I mean, the worst example was when I worked in Greece because if we won, I was the biggest hero in Athens. If we lost, I was the biggest zero in Athens. So you go from this to that. Yeah. Well, in Portuguese, oitor oitenta. Yeah. Now, the modern player is not like that because he knows I did everything I could do and so did the team. But unfortunately today, the other team were better or, or this didn't happen. But you can still, instead of having these mood swings from success is fantastic and if you lose, you're an idiot, you know, to get some kind of balance between that, okay, when you win, great. But you can win and play badly. I yeah. remember at Porto, we played this one game, and I can't remember it was a game, and we won 4-0 and we got booed off the pitch. Yeah. And this, I mean, Real Madrid is... is you know, you see the white handkerchiefs out. Now, it's not enough to play, uh, uh, not enough to win. You've got to win and make it, you know, spiritual. So everyone, oh, ah, yeah. we, lost, we lost today, but at least we could see what we were doing. That was fantastic. Now, once you get to that type of mentality, then, you know, it, it becomes incredible. Yeah, it, becomes, yeah. you know, it really is spiritual. Completely. Like... Uh... Like, like in music, like you need to make the audience, people enjoy you. You are not there, like, for example, for instance, like I was sharing before with you, my probably my, my favorite my favorite um, musician is David Gilmore. If you go to a concert of or Pink Floyd at the time or, or David Gilmore solo, yeah. even if he misses a, a note, you know, like, uh, but, but if you have a, a good atmosphere, if it's, yeah. if you enjoy, you don't care. Maybe he's only there doing the technical part. You don't have the feeling. You don't have the vibration. So that's 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 the best. Um... That's the important word, Nuno, you know, that you've just used. That vibration starts yeah. with the individual, then it goes to the the teammates, and then it spreads off into the into the crowd. Now, if you, if everyone's got that incredible feeling of, wow, oh, this is incredible. If you win, that's even more incredible. But if you lose, the atmosphere was still incredible. And yeah. we, we've got to stop being judged on you're a good coach if you win and you're a bad coach if you lose because we have a saying. I know lots of coaches that don't do not do things correctly but yeah. win. And I know other coaches who do everything right and lose. Yes. And so you can't judge a, a coach's or a player's ability on winning and losing. But what you can judge is his performance. Today, his performance was fantastic. We didn't win, but oh, I really enjoyed watching that. That was fantastic. Now, you imagine the freedom that gives the players. So they come off, and they're not going to get shouted at because we've lost 1-0. They're going yeah. to, oh, you were brilliant today. Well played. Fantastic. So the player then, the next game, has got no fear of trying new things because he yeah. knows he's going to be appreciated for what he's trying to do. Okay, if you win even better but if you lose okay but at least we could see what you were trying to do and that's when it becomes on a higher level you know that is <laughs> i think the best example is is liverpool with with jurgen klopp that he could build i think he only won not because he's a best better manager because he could he was in the right place at the right moment and he could build all the atmosphere with the supporters with the players he didn't have better players than other teams it just 
the club also gave him time to build, of course, the, the his ideas. But it was the right person for the for the right thing for the for the right place. So, Roger, it was a massive pleasure, massive honor. <laughs> Again, I think everybody enjoyed a lot. We have here uh, amazing comments. And guys, yeah, I see, I saw in here someone asking, yeah, if you can watch later, of course you can. And um, it's for me, it's like like you said, we are always learning. And I was I was hosting, but I was learning a lot, and uh, it's a big oh, pleasure. No, no, no. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, we'll be in touch. And uh, thank you again for your time, for, mm -hmm. for sharing all this, and um, and for sure, like. Uh, everybody was enjoying and learning and this is what is more important and uh, thank you thank you very much from 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 here thank you thank you thank you very much thank Bye -bye. you